my name's Courtney and I'm here today to talk about The Brothers Karamazov by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Uh, particularly coming to read Dostoevsky, uh, Brothers Karamazov, as a modern Western reader. Um, yeah, just a word of warning, I will be talking about the whole text uh, and giving spoilers, so if you haven't read the book and don't want to be spoiled, probably shouldn't watch if you have read it and are interested in this conversation please feel free to continue watching. So The Brothers Karamazov was published in 1880, and I like to concentrate primarily on the arguments between Ivan and his brother Elisha. Um, so first, a bit of history. Uh, Russia's relationship with the West uh, goes back further than Putin and Trump. Uh, it goes back even further than the Cold War. Arguably, the relationship goes as far back as recorded history. Um, but we'll hop forward to a more relevant uh, period when Russia was faced with two choices to westernize or to nationalize. Uh, so Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, even the Napoleonic Wars brought a lot of western influence uh, into Russia. It was met with a lot of hostility on some fronts. It wasn't until the 19th century really um, though that the notion of romantic nationalism uh, took a foothold in Russia and we see the rising of Solbernost. Uh, so what is Solbernost? It's the great Russian soul. It's uh, a spiritual community of many jointly living people is the definition. Um, but it's also tied in with the Orthodox Church. Uh, it's arguably the sum total of all Christians of all ages, past and present, comprising one indivisible, eternal living assembly of the faithful, held together just as much by the unity of consciousness as through the communion of prayer. It came up as an opposition to Western individualism and rationalism. Um, not that rationality is bad, but that it is insufficient uh, for understanding the world. Placed higher than reason is a non-rational engagement with the spiritual father. Um, and this category of mental engagement uh, need not be limited to God, um, but is an act of humility and commonality toward each other. Um, I'm going to quote a poem here uh, by Fyodor Tietchev um, that kind of encapsulates it. Russia is a thing of which the intellect cannot conceive. Hers is no Carmen yardstick. You measure her uniquely in Russia, you believe. Um, so arguably in Brothers Karamazov, Ivan represents the idea of westernization. Uh, Russians who wish to import rationality, individualism, uh, Protestantism, and dare we say atheism into Russian culture. Um, and then we have Aloysia um, who represents the Slavophile, uh, the Russian who values Solbernost, uh, who values community, or as uh, Nicholas first put it so succinctly, orthodoxy, autocracy, and nationality. Uh, in Brothers Karamazov, they uh, come to an argument seen particularly in uh, The Grand Inquisitor and the story of Zosima, books five and six of the Brothers Karamazov. Um, so as Western readers, we grew up in nations um, that placed a high emphasis on reasoning, on individualism, on individual responsibility and success, um, which really gives us an interesting perspective when reading something that disdains these values, that argues against these values. Um, as modern Western readers, we may see Ivan's arguments and agree with them, but the question then arises, are we supposed to? Is that the intention of Dostoevsky? Um, and arguably, no. But how are you supposed to argue against rationality? Because rationality um, is usually the standard by which debates are judged, right? Um, and according to Sobernost uh, and Dostoevsky, rationality is insufficient. Um, it does not take into account those things that cannot be explained by reason, like faith. God is real, and you can't argue that he isn't because he is unknowable and therefore cannot be touched by reason. Community, love, these sort of notions. Uh, to Do Dostoevsky, Western thought leads to deterministic social science and atheism uh, to selfishness and uh, self-serving interests at the sacrifice of community and others. Um, I'm going to quote Dostoevsky here. This is from Notes from the Underground, not Brothers Karamazov, but it still, I believe, applies. 
Science itself will teach man that he never has really had any caprice or will of his own, and that he himself is something of the nature of a piano key or the stop of an organ, and that there are besides things called the laws of nature. So that everything he does is not by his willing it, but is done of itself, by the laws of nature. Consequently, we have only to discover these laws of nature, and man will no longer have to answer for his actions, and life will become exceedingly easy for him. All human actions will then, of course, be tabulated according to these laws, mathematically, like tables of logarithms, up to 108,000, and entered in an index. Or, better still, there would be published certain edifying works of the nature encyclopediatic lexicons, in which everything will be so clearly calculated and explained that there will be no more incidents or adventures in the world. Um, so, what Dostoevsky does then is use plot to undermine Ivan's arguments. We can see uh, in one aspect Ivan's nightmare. Um, we see that his arguments are taken apart through plot as opposed to counter argument, as opposed to reasoning. Um, the world, Christ, Russia, even arguably his own personality proves him wrong. And as well, the whole trial, um, Dmitri's trial, um, works to undermine the line um, of rationalism versus faith. Westernizers uh, versus Sovereignists, um, where if not knowing the truth about who is actually guilty of the crime, we are led to believe through evidence, quite clearly through reason, that Dmitri truly is guilty of killing his father. But he's innocent, and we know he's innocent. Um, Joseph Frank, uh, who is one of Dostoevsky's biographers, he put it much more eloquently than I could, uh, so I'm going to read another passage here. The central plot is carefully constructed so as to lead with irresistible logic to the conclusion of Dmitri's guilt. The accumulated mass of circumstantial evidence pointing to him as the murderer is literally overwhelming. The fact remains, however, that he is innocent of the crime, though implicated in it by his parasitical impulses. And the reader is thus consistently confronted with the discrepancy between what reason might conclude and the intangible mystery of the human personality capable even at the very last moment of conquering the drives of hatred and loathing. The entire arrangement of the plot action thus compels the reader to participate in the experience of discovering the limitations of reason. Only those among the characters who are willing to believe against all evidence, only those whose love for Dmitri and whose faith deriving from that love are stronger than the concentration of facts, only they are able to pierce through to the reality of moral, spiritual, as well as legal, Truth in its most literal sense. And this motif illustrates why Dostoevsky could legitimately maintain that the whole book is a reply to the Euclidean understanding that created the legend of the Grand Inquisitor. So we see Dostoevsky giving the best rational arguments to the westernizers, which appeals to us as western readers, but the more charismatic and uh, more loving personalities to the Slavophiles. Um, because once one embraces supernatural agency that, that is part of being a Slavophile um, above reason, reason is by definition disarmed. Uh, reason is defined by limitation. Supernatural agency transcends all limits. Dostoevsky was free to give the strongest possible arguments to the faithless because from his perspective they're irrelevant, both the arguments and the faithless. So it's interesting how we as modern readers, as modern Western readers, have taken to Ivan and his arguments. It could also be argued that uh, the Grand Inquisitor um, gave more ground to the French existentialists um, who loved Brothers Karamazov and uh, Camus even staged a theatre production and um, gave himself the role of Ivan, which is really interesting um, because Ivan's not supposed to be held up in that light, but we as Western readers do that. Um, so I just thought I'd get those thoughts out there um, and see what you think, uh, see what um, what you think about how where we come from, um, literally the country we come from, the way, the culture, the politics that we're raised in affect our reading of books from other cultures, even other times. Um, so thank you for putting up with my rambling and I'll look forward to discussing um, these things with you in the comments. Thank you.